Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Um, I hope you're all doing well today. Um, So it is, uh, we are here together, of course, for Monday Morning Bible Study. I'm a little bit kind of discombobulated to have visitors in town. So this is my very good friend. One of my, really one of my closest friends in life is Peter Heltzel. He and his wife, Sarah, um, we've been friends for almost, yeah, 30 years. So... Yes. I'm impressed y'all are up for a Bible study on the same morning. <laughs> right. So they've been here. It was Julie's birthday this weekend and uh, and daylight savings time. And I tell you, I'm getting my butt kicked uh, in terms of just being tired. Um, so anyway, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I believe we are session six. Is that right? Was that what it says? Somewhere in there, right? Um, Chapter four, at least. Well, let me uh, open us with a word of prayer, and then we'll start. I've got a little question that I want to ask you to consider uh, in your table. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time that you give to us, the time each day, which is a gift, the gift of life, and also the time that we have specifically to wrestle Um, with your word, to meet one another in fellowship, learn from one another, to listen to your spirit, listen for your spirit. Be with us now, open our eyes and hearts, our ears, help us to hear and to grow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so uh, just in terms of where we are, I'm going to do a little uh, reminder in just a couple of minutes, but uh, more, a little more, slightly more detailed, but we're up into chapter four um, of the argument, and uh, we're just prior to a section that's going to take us back into some of the heady material around Jesus's high priesthood. So we're going to get back into sort of the more um, exalted claims, some of some of the those materials. But before we do that, we we are going to. I don't know if I said that or not. Yeah, go to the tape. No. Uh, anyway, maybe I did say it. I don't know. Well, this is, a, this, of course, this is, a, yeah, this, remember, this is probably a sermon. So I suppose it's a certain, on a certain level, it is an argument. But, um, but before we get back to that heady material, um, we're going to continue in the section that we're in, which I think it'd be fair to say is one of the many warning sections that you find in the book of Hebrews. And so this one is um, has a very striking image about God's word um, that is a double-edged sword that, can, that sort of penetrates um, in ways that the average sword would not be able to. It gets into the spirit. Uh, so I wanted to pose this question <clears throat> because I think the image is kind of after this in a certain way, and that is um, that God's word, that God is able to truly see us. So I want to give you a chance to think about what does it mean to be to you to be vulnerable before God. So take a few minutes, a little bit, and talk a little bit about this, and then we'll come back and share together. There are no right answers here. What does it mean to you? Yeah, that's right. There's no wrong. See, this is why I told you I'm completely discombobulated right now. So there are no wrong answers. This is what does it mean to you to be vulnerable before God?
One more minute. Okay, I want to invite you back together as a group. We'll share a little bit. Remember, I'm not, we're not looking for any specific right answer. Um, this is really just a chance for you to reflect. Um, I do have a mic over here, so I'd love to get this on the, on the mics as folks want to share. So I, I asked you, what does it mean to you to be vulnerable before God? So who would like to kick us off sharing? Oh, Elgin. Okay. I'm the brave one at the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we all said we all said different things, but one thing we all said in common um, was that vulnerability across the board means um, being willing to for God to show us the things in ourselves we really don't want to see, to be truly open. And we also discussed that vulnerability can mean different things to different people. I mean, I've, I've heard some Christians say, it's kind of a, it's act as if they think God, like they can hide something from God. Mm -hmm. And so for them, vulnerability is gonna mean letting God see everything as if he couldn't. But one thing we all agreed upon was just really being open and, and wanting God to show us what's bad in our life and what we need to change. Okay, so particularly vulnerability carried with it the connotation of seeing the more difficult parts yes. of yourself, okay? The unpleasant parts. The unpleasant parts, okay. Yeah. And I think this idea that there's nothing that you can hide, that's kind of an interesting one too. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Who else would like to share? Elgin. 
What, the idea of vulnerability sounds like a funny word because I, I don't see God as a mean God judging. Uh, excuse me, I have a phone call. <laughs> um, that that uh, I can disappoint God, but I can't be go to the point where I'm judged by God, where God is going to punish me. So I'm not vulnerable in that punishment sense. Yeah, I, I do want to, I, I do think it's curious. Um, have you ever had a conversation like with your partner or close friend and you were being vulnerable? Does that carry a negative connotation? Not necessarily, it doesn't. Right, you're just opening up. Yeah, so I, I think it can be, yeah, it can be both certainly. And so this is why I said there's no right answer, right, uh, that I'm looking for. But I think, and we will. You're kind of resonating on some level with the way that it's going to wind up playing out here. But I, but I also think a way to read this is precisely to read it along the lines of being seen, like, um, and all that carries with it. Not just like being seen as if you're on an operating table, but like being beheld, yeah. Oh, follow up, we got a follow up. Oh, on the subject of vulnerability, I'll make myself vulnerable. So that's a really important part of my faith and my comfort because I grew up with a lot of criticism and like, why can't you be like so-and-so? I was never good enough. Mm. And so Jesus has been my constant friend that I talk to all the time during the day in my head, not out loud, but I feel safe and accepted and seen by him. And that is a key part of of me and my relationship with him. Mm. So. It's beautiful. Thank you. Good. Sue, did you have a comment? No. Okay. <laughs> they covered the basis for your table. Okay. Other 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 folks that want to share. Right over here. Linda, you got something to share for us? You're volunteering. I'm not volunteering. I just was saying that this was one of my favorite memory scriptures. And I remember the first Bible study I went to that I heard that in, I just was so taken with the idea that God just could pierce anything in our <coughs> ego. And I was speaking about how my ego got totally out of control yesterday. And going to the mystics classes, the whole idea of letting go of that ego and getting into the spirit uh, it was just ridiculous. I came up with a solution, and it was like, that is totally my ego trying to fix something that is involves other people, it involves God, it involves whatever. And, and I like this idea that nothing that I'm doing is hidden from God, and so you don't need to go with guilt anywhere because you've got this repentance method of forgiveness and moving on in the relationship. So... Um, we talked about a lot of different meanings of vulnerable. So it could mean fear. You know, right. you go into a meeting and you're vulnerable because you're not prepared or you're fearful or there's just a whole lot of ways. Well, and I think that personally, I think that's very helpful um, interpretive tactic to use on this text because it does have, at least on the surface, a more, you know, God's going to hold you accountable sensibility. But... Mm -hmm. It can actually be read differently, I think, um, in a way that more is moves in a more like there's parts of you that you don't understand that God does, which means can also mean love and does, I think, mean love. But uh, yeah, so I think that's I think that's great. Yeah. Other. Um, Was there another table that had a comment? Let me give one more. There's got to be one more. Okay, all right. Well, I guess that's it. I guess we're going to move forward then. Um, well, let's do that. Let's, uh, let's jump in. <clears throat> Again, uh, this is material that's on your outline. 
And I just wanted to remind us sort of of the arc of the argument so far. Um, chapters one and two fit together rather nicely. In some ways, we can interpret them, I think, as a kind of argument for establishing essentially kind of the very much the baseline of Jesus's bona fides to be our high priest, our priest. And remember that uh, this is of utmost concern to the author of this epistle. Uh, this is one of the only texts in the entire New Testament. In fact, I think it is the, the only text in the New Testament that is interested in helping us see Jesus as a priest. We gave some of the background for that, right? That I told you that um, there is, you know, there are different, there were different um, expectations, messianic expectations that we can find in um, Israel, in the Judaism in which Jesus, you know, shows up. One of those is clearly the Davidic kingly metaphors. Um, and you see, you know, many gospel authors playing with that. Um, there's uh, another, though, strand that is the priestly strand. There's an expectation that um, the Messiah will also be a high priest. And so one of the big conundrums is how can Jesus be a priest? He's not a Levite. So that's kind of a practical way of why, you know, this is sort of in some ways what's going on in the background. So chapters one and two <clears throat> establish for us the bona fides in the sense that what is a priest? I think the operating assumption here that the author is functioning with is that a priest is a mediator who is able to stand between two parties because they have, in some sense, connections with both parties, right? And who are the two parties that Jesus stands between? God and humanity. So we get then at the very beginning, the opening of chapter one, some of the most you know, exalted language applied to Jesus. He is described as the icon of God, um, the image of the invisible God, right? So Jesus, uh, and as I mentioned here in the outline, G it, with Jesus, the turning of the ages has happened. We have left a time in which we heard from God through various voices, and now we hear through one voice. Now, we talked about how this is an ancient assumption that one is always better than many, that many is um, more diluted, and when you get to a time in which it's singular, you've arrived at a better time. So essentially, the author functioning within their own culture is making this argument. Um, and, uh, and it's not just any one voice. It is the voice of God's son. It is the voice of the icon of God. So this, this exalted language is also important to that. Then the author goes on and explains and sort of has to do some sifting because uh, it's not like Yahweh in the Torah or in um, Second Temple Judaism, which is the time in which uh, Jesus is living. It's not like God is sitting alone. Like there, God has all kinds of consorts and associates that do God's work, and those are typically the angels. So how is Jesus different than the angels? So we get a comparison, right, that he is superior in a sense uh, to the angels. We get like a series of texts that set, set this up for us from the author's perspective. Um, and part of the function is to say that as Jesus is um, himself is superior to the angels, so also is the covenant that he sets up superior to theirs. Now, when he says that, he's operating again, this author is operating again, with the, with the kind of, um, I'm not sure where this came from exactly, but uh, this does show up in Paul, that there was a assumption that it's actually angels who give to Moses the covenantal tablets. And, uh, and Paul uses this little idea also in the book of Galatians to kind of, um, you know, put a little bit of distance between the law and God by saying that it's angels that put it into effect. Well, the same kind of mentality, the same idea is at work here, but now it's being put to a different use. And it's simply saying that Jesus himself is superior and so is the covenant that he establishes to the other, to the covenant that came before. Uh, and so you get that uh, comparison. And the reason for establishing that is to warn the community, right? There's clearly something going on 
uh, with the community to whom this figure is uh, speaking, writing, um, offering their sermon. We don't know exactly what it is. It, it's, it's whatever it is, it is enough to tempt people to want to turn away, to want to leave um, the Jesus way and want to leave that community. Uh, and so the, so there's kind of these constant warnings to not, not turn away, don't turn away. If you turn away, man, you're putting yourself in real peril is kind of the idea I think that we get. So as I mentioned here, then you see the second clause. If that is the case, if, that, if Jesus' covenant is superior and God didn't spare those who spared disciplining those who came before, how much more so now? Right? So the idea. So it's, a very, it's pretty stern, frankly. Yeah, I, I can see, you know, I can see Elgin over here. He's just, no, he's not, he's not having it. But this is part of the argument, at least. Um, the second other thing that's really important, give me one second, is, of course, establishing that not only is Jew Jesus um, to be identified with Yahweh in a way that makes him superior even to the angels, he's also to be identified with us. He's fully human. And uh, one of the problems that seems to be sort of, uh, this is at least a surmising or a deduction that many commentators make, is that um, whomever, again, uh, the author is writing to, speaking to, they have a serious problem with the shamefulness of Jesus' death. And if you remember in the ancient world, um, people functioned um, along the, the axis of what we might call the honor-shame code, that you spent much of your life trying to increase your honor and decrease your shame. And the, and the death by crucifixion was the most, one of the, probably the, the, the most shameful death that you could undergo, and I, I tried to describe some of that. So rather, though, than this author kind of backing away from the shame, um, they embrace it, and it becomes a kind of paradox in a way, I would suggest. Um, so that, as I mentioned here in point number three, quite apart from what we might think or what the audience might think who's receiving this originally, Jesus' suffering is not a source of shame. Rather, it is the instrument whereby God overcomes. Um, and so it's like a, a mind-twisting thing, uh, in a sense. Um, and in this act of suffering, Jesus shows himself to be fully human. And I would say that aside from the Gospels, in a way, we get also, if we get in Hebrew some of the most exalted language about Jesus, we also get in Hebrews some of the most sort of like deeply human, all too human language about Jesus, that Jesus suffers, experiences perfection, cries out, etc. Like all the things that we oftentimes will associate with like the, 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 bear, the bearing what it means to be human, you know, that Jesus has gone through that. And again, of course, because he's gone through that, he can identify with us and therefore he is fitting to be a high priest, he, to, to be our mediator. So if he's fitting to be the mediator from the divine side, he's just as fitting to be the mediator from the human side. And that's really the claim that the author has been establishing, essentially. <clears throat> we then turn at the very beginning of chapter 3, and we move through much of chapter 3 and up into our section. And this all in and of itself is a coherent section, hangs together. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, a little bit of a tortured, you know, path. like it reminds me of like some of those horse paths, you know, if you, I'm from down South. So all the roads are like, they're not set out in grids. They're all set out according to weird horse paths. And, uh, this section kind of reminds me of like, where exactly are we going? Um, we're trying to get there, but, uh, you're not always clear. One of the things though, that winds up happening in this section uh, is the author rehearses, then turns to consider the great human partners of God. So if before it was considering the sort of spiritual partners of God, the angels, and showing how Jesus is superior, now we see the human partners and who is the most, the one that would be the most obvious, Moses, right? So we get this comparison of Moses and Moses works really well 
because not only uh, is Moses great as a comparison, but Moses had to deal with all these grumbling Israelites, <laughs> right? And so you get then we, we woven into this comparison section um, a really opportune moment to say, yeah, Jesus is superior to Moses, and Moses had to put up with the you know grumblers in the in the wilderness, and God disciplined them. Um, and boy, we better make sure that we don't fall into that same trap. I think is kind of the way that the logic unfolds. I have at the very end um, a, a recapitulation, and I'll kind of rehearse some of this. Let me stop though before we start because I had questions already that were generated. There's a mic right there. Okay, I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> One is, you, you mentioned that Jesus is a high priest and is an intermediary between us and God. I thought That's, that was an old thought that is no longer relevant, that we don't need an intermediary. That's question number one. Question number two, you use the term God as a punishing God. and Did I? Yeah, and that's not... I don't think I did, but go ahead. Well, his wrath will come down. I, I forget how what the word... God did not spare disciplining those who came before. How much more is he going to do? Now? I mean, he's going to be a bad guy. So that's not the nature of God. God is a loving God, not a punishing God. Help I don't me. hear a question in that last part, in that last statement. Yeah, I don't hear the last. Is there a question in there? Is God a loving God or is God as a punishing God? Okay, yes. God is, of course, a loving God. Um, is he a punishing God? Well, I, I don't think that we can move away from the idea that uh, that there are there is a certain sense in which God's love also is a purifying fire. I mean, that seems to be the the way in which Scripture operates. That's sort of the scriptural imagination, um, and the the mode, of course, of that uh, purification or whatever. Um, you can you can leave open, I suppose, and I, I would not say. I mean, basically, my you know the class that we did on Jesus and Jubilee. What I consistently said is that justice is setting right that which is wrong, but that it is not retributive; it's rather restorative. But it's still justice; it's still something does still need to be set right. So there is an element there of judgment that we undergo. I do think that that's, correct, that, that, that that's the case. And it's not clear to me how that is contradictory to love. So. I, I think. Did I say that they were thrown into fire? But I'm not saying that. Yeah. I think, Elgin, you and I agreed that we differentiate discipline from punishment to us. Let me ask you this question, way. Elgin. Do you think a Nazi should be held accountable for being a Nazi? Probably, right? The question is how? Well, either way, I'm not, I'm not bringing God into this. I'm, what about just you? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to trap you. I'm just trying to say like... I'm just trying to say, like, God is not a sofa, but like a cushion you just fall into. Like, there's active, there's actual evil in the world that God actually comes against. The way that God does so, of course, is to suffer through it. So. But God doesn't, doesn't judge God would take that Nazi and try to guide them into a different life. Of course. That's the nature of God. Absolutely. But how is that not also a judgment? God has judged that they're on the wrong path, and they need to be put on the right path. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. Though I think the author of this text, I didn't say they were thrown in the fire. Stop putting words in my mouth, Elgin. Okay, that's fine. That's that's fine. Yeah. 
Do you believe in the Bible? <laughs> Good Lord, Elgin. I think Elgin's mad about other things, not just this. Um, yeah, I mean, and I would say the, the high priestly component is, it, it is actually part of the function of this book to say that we are no longer in need of priests because we have a priest. And that priest is Jesus. There, are, there is no other need of any other mediator because Jesus himself is God and us, right? Jesus is the one, basically the idea is that he is the doorway through which we enter into God's presence. That's the argument of the, of the book. So, <clears throat> yeah, essentially talking, the way that this author I think is imagining is by talking to Jesus, you're talking to God. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yep, yep, pass it over. No, no, I'm just oh no in it because I haven't even gotten to verse one. And we're like, I got. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Um, I was just answering the question the way I thought of it. Last week we talked about. Um, the part about entering God's house. I think it's the word judgment. I mean, everybody makes a choice, right? So uh, I forget which verse it was in Hebrews, but it was entering the house. Jesus is there. There's an invitation. But you have to be a, you have to accept the invitation. If you're outside of the house, you want to call that judgment? I guess so. The invitation is to be a part of the house. But right. if you choose not to be a part of the house, I suppose one could use judgment. But the call is there. The invitation is there. Yeah. That, that's the way I think we talked about it last week. Well, I mean, my own conviction in this, Elgin, <laughs> is that God's judgment is always for life. Yeah. That's what God is ultimately committed to for all creatures, including the Nazi. Um, because the Nazi also is a creature of God. So God's judgment, to my mind, is always restorative. It's always for life. No, but I mean, he's, he's, been, they've been, he's been watching online, so he, he knows most of it. Yeah, but, but, but the author to the book of Hebrews is not necessarily always operating with that. I think we've talked about what I think is fair to say is probably someone who has a grasp of rabbinic um, interpretive methods. And one of the things that I've mentioned before that I do think is at play is rabbinic hyperbole. That is overstatement, overstatement. And the reason for the overstatement is precisely in that culture that somehow that was thought of as the effective way to bring people back. Now, I say all the things like in that culture somehow, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're only like 15 years removed from, our, from us realizing that maybe that's not the best way to talk to each other. So it's not like we've just somehow arrived, you know. But I, but I do, I mean, I understand kind of your point. But I want to make sure we separate out a little bit as we're able to kind of move through. I'm doing my best to try to be faithful to the author. But we will also make some translational moments. And, and I would encourage each of us to think about ways that we might want to do that. Um, all right, let me, let me turn us into the first, uh, our first little passage section here. Who has the mic? So maybe you guys could read our first verses here. Four, one to three? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Therefore... While the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For indeed, the good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest. Though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. Okay, so I do want to say one of the things that's kind of interesting about these 13 verses is that I feel personally like they are a convoluted mess. Um, that the author seems to be after multiple things, 
right? And um, one of them is clearly an emphasis on God's rest. And God's rest is um, clear also a synonym for Sabbath rest. And I think ultimately in the mind of the author is a synonym for salvation. That the Sabbath, the great Sabbath, is what this person is thinking of at the end of all things, right? Um, they also, though, are operating with ideas about um, when does that Sabbath rest happen? Um, to, will we respond to the invitation? The res, you know, the, there's a consistent kind of hitting away at that. So let me kind of unpack this as best as I'm able um, up to about verse 13 is as kind of as far as we're going to go today. So first of all, um, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it, right? We've already mentioned promise of this rest. This is a, a multivalent, which means it's a term that can have different, many, multiple different meanings. And it can have multiple different meanings even in this passage, which is, again, another sign that we're dealing with a very sophisticated rabbinic scholar here, someone who is very much aware of uh, rabbinic methods. Um, what can it refer to? Certainly it refers to entry into the promised land or a Sabbath, right? And this is, of course, the way that it's being described here, right? The promise of entering into his rest. We're coming straight out of comparisons with the wilderness generation and that those comparisons are going to come back in just a minute um, as well. So refers to entry, uh, entry into the, the promised land or Sabbath. But I think it also carries with it what I say here is something close to salvation, we might say. So and I, I describe it as entering, entering into God's own way of existing, right? To enter into God's own way of existing. Um, and, and that also then, as it says here, will resonate back into verse 9. So the promise of that rest is open, and one of the implications of the author is that one day it may not be open. Um, the author would probably say one day it will be closed. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to be an optimist because Elgin's going to hold me accountable to that. So in that light, though, of the promise still being open and the invitation being still standing, we should take care, right? Let us take care to enter in. Um, and what does that mean? What does it mean to take care? Um, playing off of what we've already seen, it means to continue to be watchful and mindful, right? And remember, one of the things, probably the most characteristic thing we heard earlier in chapter three about the wilderness generation is that they hardened their heart. Their hearts got hardened. And the imagery was... Uh, they sinned, they continued to sin, and over time as they continued to sin, they got sclerotic, their heart got hardened, and they could not respond when God did show up and kind of speak in a radical way. Um, and so this is the idea of caring for oneself so that one can be, I think, I mean, the way that I kind of view this in a cer certain sense is, um, that part of the task of the disciple is to maintain a certain kind of spiritual suppleness, openness to God. And the way that you do that is by avoiding putting yourself in situations that might harden you or kind of make you less supple, I suppose we might say. I think at the if we, if we translated this into terms that made sense to us, it would be to say something like, the Christian life or the life of faith is not guaranteed. It's something that you have to walk with. You have to, you shouldn't take it for granted, essentially, right? You have to tend it like you have to tend other parts of your life. Um, it's kind of the vision, it seems to me, that the author is functioning with. Then we have verse 2, for indeed... The good news came to us just as to them, them being the wilderness generation. But the message they heard did not benefit them, not because of the, anything wrong with the message, but because they were not united by faith with those who listened. That is, 
they didn't have the supple hearts, they didn't have the open ears. That's kind of the, the imagery again. So the wilderness generation returns. They too hear something about the good news of God's faithfulness in the form of the law. And I think this author sees the law as also a kind of gospel. It's just not a gospel that's as powerful as the gospel embodied in Jesus. Um, the issue, though, is not that what they heard. It's that they didn't tend to their ears. They didn't tend to the suppleness of their heart. That's kind of the vision, right? Of, of, and I mean, I think we use this language of being grounded, right? Of being open, of having, um, of showing up in a certain kind of way. Those, that's all of that stuff. I think we're kind of, that's the neighborhood that we're talking about here. Though obviously this is being refracted to through a different culture, right? So the issue then is that the wilderness generation, their hearing was to no effect. They didn't do it with faith or they didn't hear it in a way so as so that it might um, be effective. Um, verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest, right? I mean, listen to this. And this is what's kind of interesting here. It's not this, this, that's why this term about the rest can't just be final salvation. It also has to be something more, which is why I was suggesting God's own way of existing, which is something that we could potentially experience even here and now. Um, uh, and it depends, of course, how that would uh, unfold, I suppose. But for we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest, though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. One of the things I love about this, these kinds of verses, is the challenge they put to us of finding out that Yahweh also can be hyperbolic, right? That Yahweh will say certain things and then change, change his mind down the road or change God's mind down the road. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's something that we can kind of, uh, kind of wrestle with perhaps to, uh, together. But what do I see here in verse 3? The difference between then and now is essentially the difference between faithfulness and faithlessness. And if we remember, the book of Hebrews is very much interested in the question of what does it mean to be faithful to God, right? Part of that's probably driven by the concern about the community, the fact that it seems to maybe be falling apart. But we have chapter 11, right? And we also have what? The great definition, right? Faith is yada, 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 things unseen. I don't typically u utilize that <laughs> definition as way when I would talk about how I would define faith, but that chapter that talks about all the people who've come before and have shown their faithfulness, chapter 11, that tells us how deeply concerned, right, this author is with the question of faithfulness. So what does it look like, in other words, to, to have a supple heart? Well, it can look like a whole bunch of different things, because we get a whole bunch of different people put up uh, in terms of as examples. And many more besides, of course, could be put up there as well. All right, let me stop for a second and see what kind of comments or questions I have provoked here at the beginning. Yes, Nancy. I apologize for talking so much, but I'm sitting here thinking why you're, the words punishment and discipline or judgment are really hitting a trigger point for me, I guess. And I'm sitting here thinking, why is that bothering me so much? And I think part of it is I think of punishment or judgment is kind of acting out of anger. This is not what we're used to is punishment or even discipline being inflicted just to cause us pain. Like you did that, you need to suffer some pain. Right. And I'm realizing I need to not, I need to separate human judgment from God's judgment or discipline. It isn't made, meant to just cause me pain, but he is doing it out of 
love, you know, corrective measure. So I think that helps me get past that point. Um, but, you know, it, even as I say that, then I remember when AIDS first came on the scene and people were saying, well, that's God's judgment for this. You know, it's like, I don't agree with that. Um, but people do use that improperly, I think. Yeah, and, and, and never mind getting into who, who, who should actually or should not actually receive whatever yeah. judgment. Anyway. I do think, so I think this is the challenge. Like, this book is rough, right? Um, Hebrews. If it, you can read it, I think, in a way. And this is the kind of text that can be weaponized, yeah. right? And probably has been. And maybe that's kind of, we all have a certain amount of religious trauma, we might say, of things that trigger us, um, ways that scripture or faith or whatever has been used against us as opposed to for us, on our, you know, to, to help us. I think what I want to do is, the best I can at least, is to, first of all, affirm to you that I believe that at the end of all things, God's goodness is going to win. It is God's goodness that is going to overcome all of the evil, all of the bad, and that that goodness is good, right? And that, um, and that it, it functions differently. It looks differently. It does... <laughs> It's not like God comes out and, you know, has a boxing match because that's not God. God doesn't operate according to that logic. So if God's goodness is the canopy, I suppose, that I would be operating under, that, that it is God's love and God's goodness that is the ultimate, um, then we can maybe think about other ways to read this kind of language, right, I, I think so that it becomes more productive and not just something that we just don't want to deal with, which I can understand. I mean, it may be that it's stuff that we just don't want to deal with because we all have different kinds of histories with this. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Let me turn then to uh, verses 4 through 10. Is that someone watching online and they're calling in to tell you? <laughs> Can I get a volunteer who's willing? To, you guys actually, I guess over here, one of, one of you will have to read for me. Okay. For in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place it says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Again, he says a certain day. Today, saying through David much later in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. Okay. <clears throat> so you can kind of, this is the section in particular that I was talking about that feels kind of convoluted. Um, so I'll do my best to kind of move us through. And um, I'm hoping that some materials you'll be able to take away with you. And if not, then you'll just leave the other stuff behind. So um, the first thing is I just want to mention um, this is another place where we see our author utilizing a rabbinic interpretive method. method and and it's, uh, it's pronounced Gerza, uh, Gezerah Shawa. Uh, yes, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> And this is essentially, uh, there are different ways of doing Midrash. I'm sure those of you who've uh, participated in one of the 40 Orchards, uh, Steph Spencer's groups, I highly recommend just experiencing that because one of the things that you'll find that you do as you move through a text is you, um, uh, Steph is really great at pointing out like, a, like here's a key word that kind of resonates 
and then she'll connect that keyword with other keywords, and that is a very much a, 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 a midrashic uh, method. So this is a method of comparison where you take, um, you exploit the different meanings that you can find for single words um, when they show up. In this case, the single word that is clearly seems to be at play in all of these um, quotations and has already been at play is the word rest, right? So here it is rest, Sabbath, etc. And one of the questions I think that the text helpfully raises, and the only way, by the way, that I'm able to even see my way through this little pathway of briars is because of the commentators who have spent their lives, right, trying to make a sense of this passage, they mention and say the question in a sense that this text poses is, is God's rest past, present, or future? So think about, if you think about in Genesis chapter 2, or whatever Genesis chapter 1, it says that at the end of crea you know, the creative moment or whatever, however you read that, that God rested. So it sounds like it's in the past. But it also sounds like it is now, and it sounds like it might be future, right? So all three of those are options um, that are put out there. And I think the answer, in a sense, is that, in fact, it is all three, right? Um, so, but it is all three um, in an ascending order of magnitude, and this is the comparative part. So not all three of the moments of rest are the same. The first one establishes the baseline. The second one is something that we can experience now, potentially. And then the third one, of course, is the final, the great Sabbath, right? And so you could see how that would kind of expend uh, and extend the magnitude. So, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. There's our reference, right, uh, to uh, back to Genesis. Since, therefore, it remains open for some to enter it. So it's, or no, excuse me, then we turn into number five. And again, in this place, it says, they shall not enter my rest in the present. Since, therefore, it remains open for some to enter it, and those who formerly receive the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Again, he sets a certain day, today. So this whole rhetoric about today returns to make an already complicated sentence a complete and total grammatical mess, right? So again, he sets a certain day today, saying through David much later, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not enter, excuse me, do not harden your hearts. So uh, let me do my best again, as I said, to unpack some of this. So we have citations here from Psalm 95 and Genesis 2, both of which, uh, of course, Genesis 2 is obviously part of the creation account. Psalm 95 is one of the creation psalms. And the idea is that, at least from the perspective of these texts and probably from the perspective of the author of our piece, that God, in some literal sense, rested um, right after the work of creation. Um, and by the way, people in the ancient world also had pretty sophisticated notions about what creation was. They didn't think it was, they didn't all just think it was in literal seven days. So uh, there are many other folks who saw it as much more of an expansive time frame. Um, that doesn't mean that they couldn't also say when God had completed something that God entered into rest. And yet at the same time, because of this inner sprinkling, these linkages, the idea of the, the notion that God's rest is not just something that's behind us, it's also something that's ahead of us is brought in to be considered. It's part of the invitation, in a sense. Now, why is, this, why is the author using the image of rest? Mostly because earlier in chapter 3, rest, Sabbath, and promised land were all linked together. And it was the wilderness generation, so it made a lot of sense there. That's why it keeps showing up, because you, know, you could just abandon this whole metaphor and come up with something clearer but that's just not the way uh, this argument works. So verses 6 through 7 then, that was up through verse 5 with those te uh, texts, picks up again on the meaning of rest, then complicates it even more by bringing back in today. And remember, what is the function of this idea of today? 
the function is the immediacy of the invitation. In a sense, the idea is that God is always speaking to us, always inviting us. And then the implication on our side is that we should always then be supple to hear what God has to say, right? Or just to, to follow God's leading, however it is we want to put that, right? So today then refers to a kind of ever present and ever new now. Um, and it means that we can, I, I mean, I think it seems to me that we can take away from this that we can actually taste. We may not receive the whole of that rest now, but we can experience some taste of it in the now. Um, and I think that's always kind of one of the interesting things to have uh, different people of faith trying to describe what does it mean for them to live with God in the here and now. Sometimes, of course, it can be very restful, and other times it can be a hell of a storm. So then we turn now. Again, we're still Moses, right? We're still uh, wilderness generation, starting in verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak about another later about another day, right? So we're kind of returning to the argument that rest, it can't just be in the past. It can't even be in the moment of entering into the promised land. It still has to be in the future. So now we're kind of breaking out of the analogy in a way, and, and the author is sort of showing how the analogy itself kind of begins to break down. So verse 8 we have the multivalent meaning of rest return. And Joshua does fulfill his calling by leading the people into the promised land. But leading them into the promised land does not produce precisely the kind of rest, at least from the promises and the, and the way that God continues to interact with Israel. Right? It has to be beyond that. Um, so... And in this regard, Psalm 95, <clears throat> which we already saw back in verse, uh, I believe it's verse 5, they shall not enter my rest, um, that was written after entry into the promised land. So even then, they know that there's still something ahead is the idea, I think. So starting then in verse 9 through 10, or 9, yeah, 9 through 10 and then verse 11, so then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. All right. Let me just say right now, if you have on your thing, uh, like on your little outline, starting in verse 8 or verse 9 to 11, this is the landing so imagine the author has gone run down the thing and they've hit the thing and they've done all the flips in the air and you don't know what end is up. Verse 9 through 11 is the landing. They stuck the landing, okay? So whatever it is, if we can't quite make out, it sounds really confusing. When you get finally, I think, to verse 9 through 11, it becomes a little clearer, it feels to me like, at least the argument does. A Sabbath rest still remains, Right? That's what's out in front of the people. <clears throat> and for those who enter God's rest, they also cease from their labors as they share, they somehow share in God's way of being. Right? And then finally, for us, this is not just simply something about individuals. This is a communal thing. And I think this is what verse 11 is trying to get at. This is a communal invitation. And therefore, the community itself needs to build in practices, meet together. This is why we get in, in Hebrews, the one place where it says, don't abandon meeting together because we need each other to remain supple. It's kind of the idea. Now, again, this is the kind of passage that also can be weaponized and used to police people. So it can have different meanings, right? Depending on how it's deployed. Uh, and I don't wanna uh, ignore that, but it can also be something less than that. Like we come together to worship, not to police each other, but to encourage each other, to love each other, to see each other. All those things are also the things that help us be supple, to be vulnerable, right? 
So verses 9 through 10, right? To what does it refer? I think here, Sabbath rest is definitely functioning as a kind of synonym for salvation, right? Um, and this image of ceasing from labors, right? Um, which clearly harkens back, right, to the event of creation. It also, though, resonates with us because we know, right, what it means to struggle and labor in life. Um, but here, the idea of ceasing doesn't simply mean to stop. It means to reach the final goal of all of your labors, right? If you think about creation, the reason that God stops is not because there's nothing else to do. It somehow has more of a sense that the, that the, that the final telos, and telos here is the word, um, uh, is a Greek word, which simply means the, the meaning of something or its purpose, we might say, right? It, it, it implies the arriving at the telos of all things. It doesn't just mean to stop. So this is something like shalom, this great Sabbath, right? The final appearing of God's true shalom. And remember, shalom is not, peace is not simply the absence of conflict or violence, right? Shalom is wholeness, health, fullness, fulfillment, etc. I mean, it's, it's got all those connotations with it that go well beyond um, a cessation of violence. So um, in this, to enter into this in a way, we might say at the very end, um, uh, is to enter into God's way of life or God's way of living to commit oneself to that, we might say, um, which is something that is like I suppose salvation in this world, as I mentioned here, entering into God's way of life, that's what salvation is. And we can actually begin to experience that now. And I don't mean that in sort of a just ethereal, like I said all my prayers and I sung Kumbaya last night before I went to bed. I mean that in like, we can love each other, right? We can care for each other. We can serve one another. We can see one another. We can share with one another. We can share with others, right? That's what is envisioned here, I think, <clears throat> um, in terms of God's way of life. That's what awaits us, the fullness of that at the end of all things, but it can be experienced now. So then verse 11 comes in, and it says, for that to happen, we need all, all of us, this is a journey that we're on together. And here I think the image of the wilderness generation comes back also, but in a more positive sense. This is a group of people do on this journey, not just a single individual, right? So let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs, theirs being the wilderness generation. So the temptation of faithful, faithlessness is, um, places the individual and the community in a kind of peril, if we were going to say this from the perspective of the author. Um, and I think this might be also kind of, if we're trying to understand the perspective of the author, the motivation from their side, is, the reason that they're so concerned about people leaving the, the fellowship is, if they leave, it also puts all of us in peril. Like in our day and age, if people leave the church, oftentimes we're like, good. I'll see you later. Go find another one. That is not the, that's not the perspective of this author. Now that obviously has to do with the fact that there's not a lot of churches out there. It's a different world, but it is a ve also a very, very different perspective, a way that they view uh, what it means to be human and what it means to be Christian. So at all costs, then they should do whatever they can to avoid this peril um, and uh, you would hope that that would be done in a more healthy way. But we also know that, again, religious language, etc., can be very trauma-inducing and whatnot. Okay, let me stop for a second and see what kind of comments, questions. Um, did I get you through the passage? I hope I did. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, they, okay, thank you, thank you, Rich. Yeah, I got a smattering, yeah. 
Well, if there's questions or comments, go ahead. Let's let's walk through them together. Okay. So I hope you're kind of seeing like the method that we're I'm employing in this. The idea is to try to think along with this author, essentially, to understand where they're coming from. And of course, that's going to require that we do some translating for ourselves, right? To make that make, help that make sense. Um, and of course, ultimately, we want to hear from God. <clears throat> so let's turn to our last verses where we get this striking image. Uh, I think this is probably one of the images that people know from the book of Hebrews. Um, we have a, um, a mic with a volunteer to read. Elgin. <laughs> Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. So, <laughs> it, feel, it feels appropriate that Elgin read that verse, verses. <laughs> I mean, because this gets at what you were talking about, Elgin, right? I mean, this is, and this, I do think this is one of those places where uh, this could be read in very different ways, right? And maybe was even meant in a pretty, you know, particularly harsh uh, way. But I do want to remind us, rabbinic hyperbole, a different culture, different way of thinking about what it means to be human, community, etc. right? So let's start with that, try to understand the author, then we'll translate it perhaps. So I basically tried my best to go through these uh, two verses here pretty uh, um, granularly, uh, as you can see in the outline. <laughs> so uh, we have several phrases. The first, of course, is uh, the first one that strikes us is word of God. Uh, this has already showed up um, in... Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess actually has it his word of God showed up? I don't know if it has. Icon of God has showed up. And the scripture has been described as being spoken by the spirit. But this, I think, might be the first place actually in Hebrews where we get this phrase. So this, I think it's fair to say, at least in, the, in this context, because word of God is also a term that can be applied to Jesus, here it's primarily being applied probably to Scripture, that Scripture is living and active. And remember, of course, Scripture for this author only meant the Torah and the prophets. Right? There, are, there is no New Testament at this point. So there, those books might be circulating. But um, here, um, Scripture, in a sense, it is personified. And I do think because of sort of the leeway that we've already experienced of terms having multiple meanings, that we could also say that for this author, it's not just the words on a page that we're talking about. We are, in fact, actually talking about the living and present Jesus, that somehow Jesus is present um, for this author in and through uh, these texts. So what we're about to experience then is a return of that high Christology that we started with at the very beginning, right? God's ability to see and speak in uh, to our life. And again, this text in particular, we want to be careful with because it, I, I could see how terrifying it actually could be. It says to us that this word is living and active, all right? So there are two things here. Right, One is the living, the life-giving element of the word. It's, this is not just, um, these are not just descriptions of the word itself. These are also um, activities that the word applies to those whom it encounters, right? So God's word gives life, right? 
And that means that um, it is the opposite of a faithless, hardened heart, right? It is a living reality, right? Um, and therefore, as I mentioned here, as opposed to the dead and inactive heart of the wilderness generation, the Son or Word of God is alive and gives life today. But it's not only living, it's also active, energeia. Um, and this word energeia, this is the Greek word for um, active, uh, it doesn't just carry um, a sense of power, right? Energeia obviously is the root word for energy. Um, <clears throat> it carries, though, with it connotations of, of um, health. Like it's a, it's this, so this is a life-giving, health-promoting reality, right? So there's medici medicinal connotations, um, compounds that can be active and effective against contagions is sort of that that's the way this word is sometimes used in other contexts. So God's word is alive and brings life is sort of the idea, which of course is a great contrast to right what the author has been warning us not to become like and therefore wrestling with and being in, in contact with and hearing and where are you going to hear this primarily for these folks most people can't read you're probably primarily going to hear it in the context of community right you're going to hear scripture read you're going to hear it preached about etc it is and here the image uh, my peter was talking about this actually as we were driving over today um, it is uh, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, the Im some of the imagery gets a little bit hairier, scarier, we might say. Um, the sword imagery clearly um, resonates with uh, the judgment imagery. Uh, and, and this would make that, there's three different places then in this, these two verses where the notion of judgment is coming up. Now remember, is judgment though to bring death from God's perspective or to bring life? We've already heard that God's word is a life-giving, health-giving word. So allowing our idea of judgment from God's perspective, as you had mentioned before, Nancy, to kind of be shifted a little bit maybe is what uh, we're being invited into here. So uh, the sword image is associated especially <clears throat> with God's act of judgment. And that, that sharpness um, that we're going to see uh, played out here in just a moment a little bit more, um, I think one of the commentators, and basically the comment I'm about to use is from one of the commentators, um, he made the argument that it resonates with the idea of keenness of sight, a sharpness of sight. Because what we're about to hear is that this word that is sharper than any two-edged sword can see everything. It can penetrate to the darkest parts of us, um, to the place, and not. And I don't mean dark as in bad. I mean darkest places, the parts of us that we still do not understand. God can see, understand, and love. That is how I read this text personally. Um, so sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, piercing, right, until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. So dividing soul and spirit. This is going to make sense, this imagery of soul and spirit, from the perspective of an ancient author, um, in the sense that they're operating with a kind of three-part, uh, tripartite notion of what it means to be human. Human beings are made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. That, that's their perspective. I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. I'm simply saying that this is the way that they're operating. The, the body, of course, is the physical reality. The soul is sort of the individual, right, our personality. And the spirit is the divine spark that gives us life, that that's also in us, right? Um, right? We're not the source of our own life is the idea. So you have this threefold vision here, and what we're hearing is that the, the God's word, Jesus, knows us so well that he's able to actually see where each of those parts begins and ends. 
and, and is able to love and care for each of those, right? So the suke, right? Um, this is the soul, that hidden quality that makes a person unique, makes them an individual, makes them, you know, the beloved person that you know and you care about, um, the person that you see in the mirror, maybe. The pneuma, the spirit, then refers to the gift that God gives to human beings or cre creatures in general. But of course, what we hear sort of in kind of mythopoetic language back in Genesis 1 that God breathes into um, the, the body of Adam gives him life, right? And so the idea is that his life is not his own. It's a gift, but it is something that sustains him, right? So the life-giving spirit, the life force of an individual. Um, this was understood for the ancient folks uh, to be a gift of God and a kind of qualified possession. It belonged to us, but it didn't belong, belong to us. The point of this imagery of being able to um, divide soul from spirit is you and I, we don't really know where soul stops and spirit starts, but God does, right? God sees that. Um, and, and therefore, I think we can say, even if the author doesn't say, God loves it, right? God loves us. Um, joints from marrow then brings that image into the body, right? So if we were going to get the whole um, kind of vision of a three-partite human being, I don't really have anything to say about that. Uh, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, um, again... I'm hoping that we've softened a little bit the judgment language so that we've seen that it's not judgment for destruction. It's rather, in a sense, like it's more like discernment. God is able to discern us, um, which I think is maybe more helpful. Like see where we're unhealthy or maybe places where we need love or whatever, however we want to talk about that. So discern the heart. So no one can read the mind or intentions of our heart except God, right? Um, to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God, you know, no, I don't, I barely even know myself on a certain level, but God does. And that's sort of, there's a kind of gospel moment here, I think, in the midst of this. Um, there, or an invitation, at least, potentially, to live into that. <clears throat> and then we get... Uh, Again, language that we might describe as, you know, borderline terrifying. <laughs> uh, verse 13, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare, vulnerable, in other words, to the eyes of the one to whom we must render account. So there's a kind of serious business, I suppose, in, in all of this, we might say. Um, God can see and behold and therefore love and sustain. And those are also images and things that we hear about God. I mean, the first thing, the first way God is described in the Old Testament, right, is the God who sees. Right? That's the first unique name that is given to, um, to God by Hagar. But all of that also implies that there's some sort of serious business at play, I think, and, and, and certainly this author is playing with that. So no creature is hidden, right? Um, God is radically present um, and, and is present to every creature. Um, and this is where, like, you know, there's a kind of misapplication in, in our language where, we're, where we talk about searching for God or um, you know, old missionaries would talk about, I'm going to bring God to someone or that's all wrong to a certain extent because God is always already everywhere. The question is, can we see, do we have that supple heart to do so? So the whole of our lives, in other words, is lived in God's presence, um, which of course is a, um, a profound comfort, but also a little bit terrifying um, I'll say just from my own perspective, from my own <laughs> being a human. Um, and then we get this language, uh, the language of vulnerability. So this is where I was coming from with my opening question. Naked and laid bare. 
<clears throat> the word gimnos is the nakedness language. And it carries with it a really profound sense of vulnerability, like truly open, right? God can truly see us. The question, of course, that we ask ourselves, and I think that why this, these passages could be used badly or goodly is what, how do we think about who God is? And we will import that in because it makes a whole world of difference, right, Elgin? If the God who sees us is the loving, living God whose goodness overcomes all things or the imperious taskmaster God who just wants to keep, you know, hold us accountable for this, that, and the other. And that's where part of the, the I think, decision uh, that we have to make on a certain level as interpreters and people who are trying to get to know this God that Jesus told us about. So our presence before God puts us in a situation of vulnerability. So to say that we live our lives always in the presence of God, this kind of pushes that even further. It's not just that we live, you know, in the presence of God like we're actors on a stage. It's like we live in the presence of God like we're on the operating table is almost the way it kind of feels. So we're known to the deepest depths of our being um, and, uh, and that can be and should be a profound comfort even though I know it can be also uh, difficult sometimes depending again on one's view of God. This is the one, <clears throat> and this is where I'm going to bring in, essentially, because it's going to return, um, where I would bring in, who is the God who looks at me? It's Jesus. Who is the one who sees me? Who is the one who knows who I really and truly am? It's not some abstract thing. It is, in fact, the Jesus whom... Scripture tells us about, talks to us about, the one who um, knows what it means to be human, knows what it means to struggle, knows what it means to cry out to God, you know? That, and that's what the author of the Hebrews tells us about, right? That he fully was human like us, that that is the God, that is the one who sees us. So Jesus Christ, the one who died a shameful death, whom we hold, we might hold in contempt, and I'm speaking here from the perspective of the original hearers of this, we might hold in contempt because of his suffering, um, because his suffering, I should say, doesn't conform to what we think is dignified. That's the, that he is the one who beholds us, right? And so this language of suffering and of pain and of knowing what it means to cry out, my God, my God, where have you forsaken me? All of those things, to me, that's the God. That's the reality that sees us. That's the person who comes near to us. That is this living and active word whose gaze knows and beholds us and loves us completely. Um, so, again... We had to go through a lot of, but I hope you kind of see the stick the landing component here. Um, so I've got time. Jeff's got a hand up. You have to turn. Uh, there's a, uh, can you help him out? This is, here it's on. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I use the, the message, Eugene Peterson, um, and Don Harrell tried to put me down one time when we were talking about that, and I said, I've got the message here. She said, well, that's one person's opinion. But, I mean, every translation is one person's opinion, right? Anyway, let's not get into that. <laughs> but I, 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 think, I think Eugene Peterson has an interesting take here that modernizes it a bit. Okay. Starting at 12, yeah, he says, God means what he says, what he says goes. Now, here's a different take on the two-edged sword. He says, his powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. 
And a scalpel can be a more positive thing than a sword, you know. No one's going to stick a sword in you for a good purpose. Anyway, uh, as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. And I kind of like the feel of that has more positivity in it than being separated Stop. from your marrow with a two-edged sword. Anyway. I do like the scalpel image. I think the one thing that I prefer in, in the interpretation I've tried to offer is the one who is actually doing the beholding. Is, you know, the way that Eugene has it there, it's still kind of that, you know, figure off in the distance. Right. At that point, I would just say, give me this stuff and I'll go to sleep. <laughs> no, but I mean, there is the scalpel image is great in part because oftentimes can, um, sin and cancer are kind of useful. Like cancer is a useful image, typically, uh, the way that, that sometimes sin is talked about as something that has to be removed and cut out. And so that scalpel imagery would pick up on that, I think, pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have in my library um, The Spiritual Man by Watch, Watchman Nee, who was a Christian evangelist in 1921. He wrote a 600-page book about the three segments and all the scripture related to the soul and the spirit and the body. And I just love that. And so I was, I was in a small group, and I was sharing those images and they were like oh this is just great because you can see how your spirit needs to be in control of your body which is all your desires and it needs to be in control of your soul which is your emotions and your will and your intellect and if you can get that flipped and focus on your spirit being what is leading those other segments it makes a little more sense in the scripture it makes sense in scripture as you go through it so yeah, and and and, uh, and Watchman Nee obviously is one who kind of embraces the tripartite. There are other positions, of course, that have also been articulated in the history of the church. So it's not necessarily a settled area, but I do think that you know you can find very useful kind of images like that. So, Nancy. Going with the physician analogy here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just wanting to say, I was reading this this morning, uh, one of my favorite books, old book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made by Dr. Paul Brand, uh, Philip Yancey being the co-author. Um, but what's nice about Dr. Brand's book is it's not just the scalpel, I'd use laser, but um, in each section, things that we think of as death are life. And the best chapter on that is on blood, uh, because blood is life. It's not death, the way we think of it. But um, in his conclusion, he talks about the weak parts of the body sustaining, uh, the, the strong parts of the body sustaining the weaker parts. And as these tissues are being separated and supporting one another, another I think it's out of Corinthians with some of the analogies to the body, um, it feels more positive to me in that it's not just cutting out the cancer. It's about all of the tissues of the body support one another. Mm. And um, can the, the, the strong support the weak? And that's really how I look at it, too, as uh, what God is doing with these sections of us, if you will. But Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you... Did you come? You finished? Okay. I apologize. I don't think I heard the last part because I sneezed so hard. Um, Pete? Okay. What you said about the piece that passes all human comprehension when we were talking earlier, because this is a difficult passage to really be vulnerable to God and let Jesus see us where we are. But that 
the fruit is peace. And that really is my prayer for Meeting House. I just want to really encourage you because you're putting into practice what the author of Hebrews is calling to gather together like we did yesterday for worship and then early in the morning for Bible study. And Christian and I went to uh, Gordon-Conwell Seminary together. But as I really think back in my life of morning Bible study, there were only two times. One was at Wheaton College, um, some of the Korean students would wake up at 5 in the morning and have Bible study, and I was invited to join them. That's not happening, by the way. <laughs> and we'd read the Bible and pray, and they would start to rock like this, you know, and they were praying in um, Korean, which I didn't understand, and then they would ask me to pray, and I'm from Mississippi, so I'd be like, gracious, almighty, and eternal, heavenly Father, and, you know, it was like a different cadence to the prayer. But the only other time was when I was doing campus ministry with Crew, which was Campus Crusade for Christ, out of Park Street Church in Boston. And we would go out to the college students and, and once again have Bible study at like 5, 6 in the morning. And so this is completely out of the box. But I'm just wondering if there's any college in this area and there's any way meeting house could help with like a um bible study prayer time for college students and with that At five o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question pete i mean there actually are i mean there are several colleges around here and there they do most of them have pretty robust um college uh, ministries, but I would love to see us find ways to engage uh, college students. I think probably everybody in our room would love to see that because it would be younger people bringing in also all their questions that they're wrestling with today. So keep praying for us to figure that out. Thanks for raising that question. Okay, we are time over, and I really thank all of you for coming. Uh, we will rejoin together next Monday, is that correct? Or do we take off next Monday? That's right. Let me just check here. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> so we will, we take off next Monday, um, and then we'll come back. We're going to, we'll do, I think we meet through, is it, can, does somebody have the, let me, maybe I should pull up my calendar just to make sure here. Um. No, I, I, so I'm going to be out of town on the 18th and then I'm going to be on, out of town on the 1st. But then after that, we'll be, we'll have several weeks in a row. So we're going to have a couple of weeks here where we kind of meet and then we don't meet. We do meet the 25th and then, um, and then we will take off on the 1st and then we'll come back and we'll kind of go through April up into May. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, and we're going to do our best to get through, of course, all of Hebrews, and uh, we're doing okay. You know, it takes a little while, though, but let me, uh, I know as everybody, folks uh, have things they need to do, so let me just pray us out of the room, so thank you so much, um, Lord, thank you for this day, thank you for, for the gift of life and fellowship and the possibility of coming together. Help us, O oh God, to continue to have supple hearts and ears and also to have the courage to act on the, the nudgings and guidings of the Spirit to seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. We ask and pray now for your blessing as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen.